Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Adventures in Brain Injury Podcast. My name is Kevin Ballister. I'm a severe traumatic brain injury survivor, creator of adventuresinbraininjury.com, creator of feedabrain.com, and author of How to Feed a Brain, Nutrition for Optimal Brain Function and Repair. With me, as always, is my beautiful co-host, Michelle Malmberg, acquired brain injury survivor times two. What's up? Well, I'm so excited about uh, what's, what's up coming down, the, uh, coming down the line to the our listeners today. Yeah. Yes, well, before that's what's we up. introduce our guests, uh, I want to I wanna thank Revive Treatment Centers for their sponsorship. Um, Revive is a multidisciplinary clinic focusing on post-acute care, neurorehabilitation with patients with concussion, with brain injury, with stroke, autoimmunity, developmental disease, and neurodegenerative diseases. And I'm actually going to be making it out there in just a little bit, actually. <laughs> That's pretty exciting. It is very exciting. It's great that yeah. it's in your home state, too. You get to see That's Papa. That's so true. Yeah. 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 So you yeah. can find Revive at, at revivecenters.net. Anyway, let's move on to this, this uh, fabulous uh, guest we have on our podcast today. And I would like to introduce him, please, and thank you. <laughs> please go right ahead. <laughs> Thank you. So today we have Dr. Kyle Daigle. And Dr. Daigle is professionally trained as a chiropractor, and he joined SNA Technologies, Systemic Neural Adaptation Technologies, in December of 2014 as the president, chief medical officer, and managing director for SNA Global. He is the co-inventor of a patent-pending digital therapy software program called NeuroSage. We got a little peek at that. That's very interesting. Keeping his finger on the pulse of his patient as his career grows in new directions, Dr. Daigle still owns and operates a successful clinical practice called Ultimate Performance Cairo and Rehab in Lake Charles, Louisiana. Dr. Daigle played college baseball at McNeese State University, where he was a member of the 2006 Southland Conference Championship team. So now we know why and how he is hitting the ball out of the park with neuro rehab. Dr. Daigle left McNeese and moved on to Louisiana State University to continue studies in biological science. And we're pretty glad he did, because while at LSU, Dr. Daigle worked as a research assistant in the Pennington Biomedical Research Center. Stepping up to bat again, Dr. Daigle attended graduate school at Parker College of Chiropractic in Dallas, Texas, where he actively served as the Nutrition Club president. So put all this together, and he found his way to becoming a member of the International Association of Functional Neurology and Rehabilitation, and has his 100-hour certificate of completion in functional neuro treatments. His dedication and achievements have been noticed, and the International Conference on Neurology and Brain Disorders has chosen Dr. Daigle to be one of the organizing committee members for their upcoming conference in Valencia, Spain this year, where he will deliver his lecture on advances and challenges in neurology and neurological disorders. Dr. Daigle, welcome to Adventures in Brain Injury. Thank you very much for that awesome introduction. <laughs> you are Thank so you for welcome. The awesome stuff that you're doing. Yes. <laughs> I wish I was going to Valencia with you. That sounds fantastic. Very cool. Be fun. Yeah. So, so baseball to neurology. That's awesome. Yeah, man. It's it kind of worked in. You know, you got to see the ball to hit the <laughs> ball, oh, yeah. and uh, that was my problem. Is I wasn't a consistent hitter, and I found out why is that oh. I had some vestibular issues and some eye issues. Awesome. Yeah, it's so true. I mean, sports in general, we, we use our brain for just about everything <laughs> we do. So it's pretty cool to like, to, I, I guess you can, you can hop into neurology from any avenue and it's like, yeah, it's related. 
So it's, it's pretty cool. Um, but I, I was wondering, like, and actually your clinic is called Ultimate Performance. Say, say the name of your clinic again. So it's, it's Ultimate Performance Cairo and Rehab. And it's, it's reason what happened is, is I try to figure out a way to make the word up. You know, like I'm obsessed with vertical live it's looking up <laughs> help out with firing into like the midbrain. So I tried to make some sort of tie and uh, and performance. And that's where I came in ultimate performance just because, you know, the way we do rehab in here is everything we do, we engage some sort of, of eye exercise. Mm. And uh, it's been, you know, a very, adva- you know, from a competitive advantage, we've had that over majority of clinics, especially in, you know, Louisiana, because, we're not just doing your traditional rehab. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. This is like the new model of neural rehabilitation. And as your clinic uh, states right in its name, an ultimate performance, you know? And if you take the two words, U and P from ultimate performance, you get... Ah. <laughs> Bam. <laughs> Look at that. That's fabulous. Yeah. So, um, you, you know, a couple of years ago, you sustained a traumatic brain injury. Can you tell us about that? I did. Yeah. I had a best friend of mine from college. He came in, he just finished dental school and he and I were at a local casino hanging out. And, um, as we're hanging out, I, um, wake up, uh, you know, and I'm in the back of an ambulance and I'm covered in blood and I thought I got shot. I wasn't sure. And there was this guy who obviously, you know, um, he was kind of, popped up on steroids and I think drunk picked me out of a crowd and didn't know me at all came and just, you know, used by, he actually had six blows to the head and I was knocked unconscious after the second one. And this guy used the ground as a deadly weapon and had to go to court, all the cases and stuff and had plastic surgery. And, um, that left me, you know, into what kind of developed into our software company is, is, you know, from that TBI, it led me to have, you know, a bunch of, neurological issues like vertigo, balance issues, different visual disturbances to uh, gastric issues where I started having issues with my stomach and food sensitivities. And then that led me into having like histamine reactions and my energy levels dropped. And, uh, and it was just a wreck. And so, you know, getting started in practice earlier on, I didn't financially have a lot of money. And so I had to figure out a way to try to rehab myself. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's what really got me into, you know, going back into learning more neurology so I can actually use, you know, what's what's out there and kind of trying to help better myself. And uh, I was able to successfully kind of overcome that with, you know, doing functional neurology and, and functional medicine with nutrition. That's so awesome. I mean, when we're learning, like our life depends on it because it does I yes. it over and over and over again. But I just love seeing these examples um, of where like, you know, and I also loved how you brought up how, you know, your digestion was affected, that all sorts of different um, things are affected. Uh, because as, as I said, your brain kind of, kind of has something to do with, everything <laughs> right and actually a lot to do with just about everything so yeah that's that's really interesting and we were talking before we came online about how vestibular disorders and um and possibly cerebellar disorders can affect motility and digestion can you expand on that yeah so when you look at the way that, you know, neurology works and look at how the vestibular system fires in, it actually does. There's, you know, there's a connection not too far from the vestibular nuclei and part of the brain where you have where the vagus nerve, it's called the dorsal afferent nucleus uh, of the vagus nerve is. And that thing actually goes out and innervates the GI tract. So nausea, vomiting, you know, irritable bowel syndrome, constipation um, can actually be affected by a vestibular disorder. And so if you improve that, what happens is, is let's say if you know how to maybe do some vestibular exercises like eye movements, um, um, you know, there's a thing called gaze fixation where you look at a dot and turn your head left and right. You increase blood flow to this vestibular nuclei. And what it could do is it can actually improve, you know, the, the vagal out tone or the vagal tone. And you got to think about this. So imagine um, you, you know, a lot of times people, they don't cook their food anymore. And they just go and start eating it. 
and they don't smell their food, they don't look at their food. And the whole purpose of the brain is the brain has to see what you're going to eat to be able to know to produce saliva, to be able to help produce enzymes to digest your food. And then your stomach needs acid to be able to break down your food as well. And then you need acid to be able to tell your pancreas and say, hey, I need some enzymes and some insulin. So that way I can take all the sugar that I'm exposed or broken down my food and get it into the cell and then break it down. And that's what happens after a TBI is a lot of times people get all these stomach issues, having blood sugar issues, because in my opinion, there's some sort of dysfunction in the vestibular nuclei or the vestibular system. And that actually has a, you know, a contra say indication, a, an impact over decreasing the vagal nerve. And that's why when TBI patients, you look at them, they say, hey, you know, I'm having palpitations, my heart's racing, I can't sleep at night, you know, I feel like I'm just losing my mind, I'm, I feel like I'm almost, you know, being suffocated to death, and they really are. And you go doctor to doctor for all these different medications whenever maybe it could just be, you know, you do some vestibular stimulation, improve your vagal outcome, and now, you know, you're able to digest your food properly and your blood sugar gets stabilized. That's, that's absolutely phenomenal because if someone was to go into a family doctor and say, geez, I'm, I'm having gut pain, the first thing that's going to be prescribed is something to uh, quash that symptom, to just eliminate the symptom of acid reflux mm -hmm. or IBS. But you're saying that if we actually focused on what the brain was telling the digestive system, that it could be resolved without any of these pharmaceutical inputs. That's my opinion. And I totally agree. Yep, absolutely. Or, or you'd be uh, sent to a specialist on the gut, a gastroenterologist. And uh, he's he, like that, that gastroenterologist would be fantastic at understanding the, the gut. But what about the brain, the, the puppet master to the gut? And that's, that's, I, I really, really appreciate that. So for our audience, could you um, define vagal tone for us? So I'll give you an example of vagal tone. Right. Um, to, to be able to determine how well your vagal tone is, is if you actually take some water, and I've learned this from Dr. Datiz Karazian, who I absolutely love, is that if you were to actually <laughs> really start well. to you gargle, gargle water to your eyes here, and you're going to see that you might gargle for weeks, months, you know, six months, and your eyes still don't tear. And that right there, gargling and your eyes tear, uh, that's a great indication to show you how well the tone of the vagus nerve is. So your vagus nerve, it's known as the wondering nerve. This thing goes and innervates everything from your heart. You know, it helps out with keeping your heart rate stable. Um, you know, you look at your pancreas, it helps out with uh, you know, insulin and, and uh, enzyme secretions, you look at your stomach, it controls, you know, your hydrochloric acid. And so think about all these people that have acid reflux, that have diabetes, um, that have having issues with their liver, they're not able to detoxify, they have high cholesterol. Um, so I think that right there would be a way to say, hey, that, that vagus nerve, that tone of that nerve is not good. So the vagus nerve tries to help out with kind of keeping everything kind of relaxed, or you can digest properly. So if you're not going to the bathroom or you're not pooping every day, you're not sleeping good throughout the night, and if you gargle and your eyes aren't tearing up, then you have a poor vagal tone. Interesting. So sleep is related to vagal tone. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you can't sleep, then you're looking at you're having some sort of stressor going off in your body, and if that stress resolves, that vagus nerve is not being kicked in. Interesting. Now, how many doctors, how many sleep specialists are actually looking at vagal tone when it comes to, I mean, the, the number of prescriptions for sleeping medication that are dispensed each year. Wow. Wow. Well, so let, we could be a drug-free nation. Yeah. Well, let me give you an example. So I have this patient comes and sees me seven years insomnia. The guy's a CPA agent. I wrote a book and I actually wrote about this guy in my book, uh, which by the way, my book is called What If You Knew? Okay, so this guy, you. this guy was exercise. This guy was exercising, and then he got a new job, and the job started consuming his life. He was working in a cubicle, spending all day on a computer screen. Quit exercising, felt like he was tired, so he puts nightshades all over his whole entire house, so he has no natural light. And then what happens is this guy starts developing insomnia. 
So he goes and has sleep studies done, all the stuff. They put him on a cocktail of all these different kind of medications, sleep meds, anxiety medication, depression medication. He has to start taking amphetamines to wake up in the day. Oh, so four, four or five different medications. He comes to me. I look at him and I'm like, hey, man. You know, I asked him, I said, hey, I, I want you to, you know, I started doing a bunch of stuff. I check in his pupils, check his balance, his coordination. He's all off. The guy, you know, started gaining weight. Uh, he's telling me he's got bad acid reflux. So I tell this guy, I said, look, you're going to think I'm crazy, but I think this, this solution will help you out. What I'd like for you to do is I'd like for you to wake up early in the morning, and I want you to wake up when the sun rises and, and you know, go to bed before the sun sets or when the sun sets. I want you to go walk. I want you to exercise, but I want you to exercise looking at the sun. Walk, look at the sun as it's rising. And I told him this, and the Nobel Peace Prize was won last year over the, over the circadian rhythms being set, or a biological clock being set by light. Yes, yes. And what we did is, is we literally for two weeks, we helped recalibrate his circadian rhythms by him walking, looking at the sunrise, and then in, in, in the evening, sunset, and then going to bed not too long after that. And this guy went from taking all these different meds to our four or five different meds and gets able to get them all off because his sleep was restored simply because we use the natural stimuli. And, you know, it's stuff like that that, you know, I think people that can't metabolize all the drugs their own anyways but i think sometimes the drugs are causing other problems whenever sure. this guy literally all he had to do was walk and watch the sunrise <laughs> wow, mean, that's, crazy. That's, that's so cool it just reset the circadian rhythm well but, that and and can you imagine just what that does to the whole body when we revert to natural movement in a natural setting albeit probably an urban setting, but still we're getting out and we're with the cycle of the day. We add in the light. I mean, everything wakes, you know, I just, I love listening to the birds wake in the morning and, mm -hmm. and everything comes alive in the morning hours with the warmth and the light and the, the winds start to pick up as the heat rises, you know, it's, it's, it's a beautiful unfolding of the day. And, and so that, is actually programming our brain then. Yeah. And, and you know, we didn't know adaptation was to say, how can we start using a digital intervention, whether it was virtual reality or developing games that we try to get a color pattern to do eye movements. We had people literally like turning their head left and right, moving their head to engage the vestibular system while we're using different type of photonic, basically light stimuli with acoustic, different sounds, different melodies and all that. And, um, yeah, I mean, that's uh, that's kind of how we do rehab in here. But I, I just think that there's an alternative method to just taking a bunch of medications. And I do, you know, I do believe, you know, that there are certain times, especially emergency care, where there's certain even hormone care that people need all these, you know, need some pharmaceuticals. But I think what a chronic condition, even like even a post TBI case, you know, I think we need to figure out what's driving this thing. Is it food allergies? Is it food sensitivities? You know, do people not have enough of digestive enzymes? Are people not, you know, passing their bowels or they're not going to the bathroom regularly? We need to get that system engaged so they can actually expel these products, these waste products. And if you can't do that, you keep putting medication that people can't metabolize things. I, I just think that's how we kind of feel like people when you get a TBI or any brain, brain injury, you start feeling like you're being choked and you're just given more meds and more meds. But it, there's, there's got to be a solution. And I feel that if you look at the vestibular system and try to recalibrate or restore someone's, you know, vestibular system, their balance, their coordination, you can actually have impact of an improvement in their vagal tone. And within that, the vagus nerve is a wandering nerve. It helps innervate almost all your internal organs. So you get better outcome, you know, better function, better blood flow, better function. That's, well, that's awesome. Yeah, that is Guys, phenomenal. can I pause you for a moment? Go um, ahead. Yeah. All right. I'm, I'm, I'll be right back. Okay. So, and then and then we'll we'll come back and talk about neurosage. So I'll let you guys go. Are, ahead are you that. are you keeping the the recording the audio no. rolling? No, I'm not. Oh, okay, so we can talk about you. <laughs> That's right on. I mean it, it, using sensory input to affect the brain. I mean that's what we do, right? Okay. We receive input from our senses which affect our brain and using that as our medication, the actual use of, of stimulation, either video game style, 
like uh, like your um, your machine, the Neurosage, which I want to talk about, um, really affects neuroplastic change. Could you expand on that? Yeah. So let's say this. Let's say that somebody has cognitive issues. Let's say somebody has um, like attention deficit disorder and these kids can't focus or someone can't focus. So um, let's just say that if you're, you know, you're in student and you're in school, teachers always tell you, you know, for example, me, they're like, Kyle, keep your eyes on your own paper. And if I didn't know the answer, what I would do is, is I would look and see to the girl next to me who was really smart, you know, what did she have? And it's because if you don't know the answer, you move your eyes, you typically look up. And so vertical eye movements can actually fire into a part of the brain called the brainstem. So what I could do with someone, I'm evaluating them and they're having cognitive issues. I say, hey, go ahead and let me just follow my finger. Let's look up. And as they look up, I see it's slow. It's slower than if they go left or right. So, hey, maybe there's a weakness within their vertical eye movement. So maybe that, you know, they're not producing enough of dopamine. Okay, so then now I can maybe test this person and say, hey, is there a metabolic portion? Does this person, you know, do they have anemia? Because iron could actually produce dopamine. Do they have any B vitamin issues? So if that's the case, then I can do vertical eye movements to rehab someone and help out with their cognitive function. Or I can go ahead and roll out by doing some blood work and finding out why this person is not having dopamine or why they can't focus. And I see that all the time. And so all these people that are on these amphetamine medications, they literally, if they would start doing eye movement exercises, it could actually help out and prove that. So we could try to reduce their amphetamine usage. Uh, Parkinson's, for example, Parkinson's patients, so they like move really slow. They kind of have tremors, they shake. And then if you actually have them say, hey, look, let's look up and down, they can't do that. That's like tilt their head back. So they actually have a deficiency in dopamine. So they're given a drug called L-Dopa, but what if we actually, like we have a neural stage, we created video games that actually used a bunch of vertical eye movements. What if maybe we can use a color pattern, for example, a certain color that can, excuse me, that can actually improve one side of the brain in relation to the other. And this is where, you know, I'm a huge fan of Dr. Robert Malilo, the guy who wrote the book Disconnected Kids. Yes. Because he uses color therapy to also help out with brain rehabilitation. So what we did with Neurosage or SNA was we did a combination. We said, hey, look, let's go ahead and see if we can activate the left side of the brain using certain colors. Let's activate the right side of the brain using certain colors. Let's use different eye movements. Let's do vertical eye movements to improve someone's midbrain. Help out so with dopamine function. What, what colors um, stimulate the left and what, which colors stimulate the right hemispheres? So red, orange, and yellow activate the left side and then blue indigo and violet can activate the right side of the brain um, and, and what happened is is earlier on you know i started noticing that when i was having patients come and see me and this was an observation i would notice that you know let's say someone was in chronic pain and they took off from work that day to come see me i would notice and look at the color clothing they were wearing and what we would do is we were doing eye movements based off of the colors that they were wearing and, you know, I use color lenses, we use color dots, um, same thing even happens with people with like frozen shoulder, like, you know, following a TBI, like I just had a kid the other day that flew in from New York to come see me, I'm in Lake Charles, and this kid couldn't lift his shoulder up, but about 75 degrees. Now, this is six months post the TBI. So, what I did is I found that if we had this kid do a series of vertical eye movements with a certain color, that I can restore his full range of motion. Mm-hmm. Now, and that's what we decided to take Neurosage, and we programmed all that stuff. Yes. I'm sorry, I'm talking fast. I get like super excited over no, this. No, it's super excited. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> hey, that that drug you're taking here. Let's just do some eye movements, and your wow. brain will produce its own dopamine. Wow, <laughs> like it's pretty phenomenal what you got going on. So, can you describe to me what Neurosage is exactly? So Neurosage is a, it's a non-invasive way that uses visual, acoustic, and physical stimuli to basically help optimize brain function. And is it like a TV video game thing? Is there like, like, what does it look like? So we sell a platform. 
And so the platform comes with a couple of things. One, it comes with an Xbox controller. So we use different type of uh, dexterity movements to control the gaming environment. We do have uh, two things. We have like a, a regular television monitor. And then our new thing that we're working on is virtual and augmented reality. So virtual reality, I don't know if you're familiar with virtual reality, but virtual reality is where you put like these headsets on and you're like physically like in a virtual world and you have augmented reality, which is where you can actually see the world around you, but yet you have holograms. So let's say that um, someone has cyber sickness, uh, which is motion sickness that people get with virtual reality. They get that most of the time because they don't know where their nose is, where their eyes, so the, the difference between your nose and your eye, your brain kind of gets uh, almost like discombobulated and it's like, hey, you know, things are moving around. I don't really know where I'm at. Ah. That can actually induce. So what we found, and even the U.S. military, I was reading a bunch of different case studies, but if they would actually put an artificial nose on the bottom of the screen, you can actually reduce the chances of you getting cyber sickness because now your brain can actually see spatial orientation of where your nose is. No yeah. kidding. Wow. That's amazing. So, so that, and, and then one thing we have, when we have a vibration platform where we use, uh, there's a company called Viplate. Yeah. Um, Viplate uses specific vibrations. Um, we have found that, you know, there's certain frequencies that can do cool things. For example, like one that could really help out with improving brain function. And then um, one that can help out with pain management. And then uh, we actually co-invented a product with them, which hasn't been released yet. But um, it's a vestibular rehab chair that vibrates. Um, so I can actually like, you know, put you in a chair, spin you, tilt you, you know, tilt you front and backwards, left and right, while you're, you know, in virtual reality or playing a video game on NeuroSage. Cool. Huh. So what's the purpose of the vibration? So vibration is a couple things. One is that it acts a specific pathway in the spinal cord that helps out with what's called proprioception, so your spatial awareness. Yes. It also helps out with balancing coordination. If you do target vibration, uh, for example, like on the bottom of the feet, then, you know, say on the left foot, then I can activate the right side of the brain. Um, vibration also increases circulation. So if I increase circulation, I can increase blood flow, uh, increase blood flow, increase function. Okay. So if you know kind of specifically, let's say that someone had a TBI, uh, like a brainstem injury, and you know they have that flex posture. Well, if I want to go ahead and try and activate those extensors, you know, I could sit there and try to pry that person open, or I could start using some vibration to increase circulation to those extensors and then try and do that, you know, some sort of active range of motion or even stretch someone out. And uh, it's easier to stretch someone out or make a muscle move if you have blood flow going to that area. Sure, sure, of course. Well, that's that's what's feeding it, right? The the blood contains uh, all of the information, the nutrients, the oxygen, um, to to cause cellular function. Correct. Yeah. So this is like this is this new wave of neuroscience medicine, where we're we're seeing how we can affect neuroplastic change without the use of exogenous drugs or drugs from outside. And we can use exercises so that our brain um, makes the neuroplastic changes, has, um, has the, the, the releases the neurotransmitters, all of that good stuff. So um, tell me what, what are some applications for, uh, for, neuroscience medicine okay well i think that falls into any category just because the brain controls everything so let's say i have headaches and migraines you know if i could increase circulation to <clears throat> to the brain that i can improve that um if i have vertigo symptoms so dizziness then maybe i might find a certain canal in the ear that someone is basically like you have these little canals in your ear it's called the semicircular canals Maybe I can actually do some sort of eye movement to activate one canal. Uh, maybe I can do head positions while someone's, um, you know, doing some sort of exercise. Pain management, it works awesome. Balancing coordination issues, uh, neurological disorders such as Parkinson's disease with gait, reducing tremors, 
improvement in cognitive function, uh, multiple cirrhosis with gait issues, uh, balance issues with multiple cirrhosis because I can actually increase, you know, circulation to their legs. And then you get into sensory issues with all these autistic kids and kids with ADHD and Asperger's and Savant syndrome. That yes, maybe yes. you can, you know, you can start trying to uh, do different type of tasks to activate one side of the brain. Uh, speech issues, you know, people with Lou Gehrig's disease, um, they start having issues with their speech, even post-stroke, where I can try to maybe do some vibration over certain, maybe the tongue or maybe the, you know, the throat or even the cervical spine, do some eye movements to help that out. So, I mean, there's a lot of applications, you know, even post-TBI, um, you know, TBI is kind of, hey, go sit home, wait it out, uh, you know, stay away from bright lights and music and strobe lights. Um, my opinion, I think the way that you know, the brain, the brain needs stimulation. I feel that as our society, we're declining because we're not moving anymore. I mean, people don't go to the grocery store. Now you can get an app and literally have your groceries, you know, at the door waiting or you're brought to your door yes. and people aren't moving and the brain is, it thrives off of sensory stimulation and we're just simply not stimulating the brain anymore. And in my opinion, this is why we're seeing all these different neurological disorders is because people aren't moving. So, and again, you can't put people in a cookie cutter approach, you know, in rehab where we're just doing specific exercises like, you know, sitting and standing, maybe, Hey, that person needs to maybe do some figure eights on their left side of their body to help activate their cerebellum. Right. Maybe. So it's stuff like that, that, you know, I think really any application neurological intervention works great. You know, people have an irritable bowel syndrome or SIBO. Maybe you might need to do a vagal exercise. Maybe you need to gargle. Maybe yes, do some yes. sort of gaze fixation and uh, increase circulation to that area while you're doing some sort of nutritional intervention or whatever, pharmaceutical approach. I just think that, you know, we just need to really, um, neurological intervention needs to be, in my opinion, mainstream with any type of rehabilitation. Oh, it sounds like it. I'm I'm completely convinced of that. And and then just as a um, farmer's daughter, let me uh, put a little a little plug in. Could you imagine if people actually, instead of going to the grocery store to get their own groceries, actually went out to the garden and tended to their own groceries as they were growing? <laughs> That's true. And it's just there's a connection with the you know there's a connection with plants. You know, people that. Uh, I don't know if you've seen, I'm sure you have seen studies where people literally take a microwave and they microwave water and put it on a plant and it kills the plant. Yes, um, yes. So, I mean, there's just think interaction. you got to be cautious on how you interact with plants. And I think that's what's happening to our food source is it's becoming contaminated and uh, we're eating contaminated food. Yes, yes. And that is a podcast on its own. Oh, my good heavens. So yeah. what kind of, what, you know, I mean, it's, it's very true with, with, uh, with the, the amount of toxins and just things that are brand new to the human species in the past hundred years are huge. And we're seeing lots of changes as you're saying. Um, I, I was curious as to what kind of results you're seeing with your therapy. Oh man. I mean, so, you know, hand contractors, someone has a post stroke, uh, we can help significantly improve the spasticity so we can improve the range of motion, the coordination. Um, looking at SIBO patients, you know, people that have been battling autoimmune issues, you know, we've had a lot of improvement just, with. I'm yes. just going to interrupt you, um, Dr. Dale. Could, is SIBO for um, our listeners, S-I-B-O. Would you explain SIBO? Yes. Hold on, hold on just a second. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm sorry, I still have patients in here. Go ahead. What's up? I'm just saying. That. Oh, all right. See you later, man. I did get acupuncture points. That's the only thing I didn't do. With okay. Else, you want me to see if one of them can do it for me? If, if what? Acupuncture points. Okay. Yeah, I can do them in just a second. Okay. I can, wait. can you hear me, guys? You betcha. Go ahead. See okay. you so, so, small inflammatory bowel disorder. Um, it's similar to a thing called like dysbiosis where you have an abnormal accumulation of like good and bad bacteria within the small intestine. Um, so a lot of patients who kind of have like the sharp stabbing pain, people have a lot of autoimmunity issues. I think that SIBO needs to be looked at, you know, and how you find that out is doing a stool sample, uh, which, you know, a lot of times you go in, they're just throwing blood work. I think that people need to have 
I think people need to have their stool checked out. Yes, yes. Yeah, it is. Um, it's so overlooked, I think, in my opinion. Um, uh, you know, we, we don't really look at what's going in, and we certainly don't look at what's going out. We're just looking at what's, what's happening in the blood. And um, there are all of these imbalances that aren't correlated properly. Functional medicine is doing an excellent job in functional neurology um, at assessing these, these labs. But if we did just what you said, you take a look at um, the autistic children and ADHD and, and what's going in, and then we take a look at what's coming out. There's a, there are many clues available to us, and they're all non-invasive. Yeah, so I'll take, give you an example. So I had a girl yesterday. She was a soccer player in, in college, got concussion, and uh, started having issues with her gait like six years later, and then started having issues with her, you know, bowel. She developed irritable bowel syndrome, found out she had a gluten allergy, and then her, again, her gait got worse, started having crazy sharp pain. And then uh, after that, one of the things that happened was um, – started getting visual disturbances. So she's been to four different top hospitals, four different top neurologists, coming to find out she actually had, um, you know, they told her she needed psychiatric care. She came and seen me. I found out she was actually having some autoimmune issues in certain parts of her brain. And, uh, and I think that's what's happened. I think a lot of patients who they're going through and they're going doctor to doctor and they're not looking at the autoimmune issues. And it's really because we have a hard time treating autoimmune cases from our traditional medical approach. Yes. So, um, so, you know, I think a lot of people are being overlooked because uh, just doctors simply aren't trained and they don't have any knowledge of what's really going on. And then how do you even treat something when the immune system is attacking the brain? Um, right. So I think nutrition is the answer. At least that, that could possibly be at least something to maybe slow or halt the progress or slow, slow hold or, or halt the progression of these diseases getting worse. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, brain. Yeah, <laughs> brain. And then also the I mean, you know, that's one part of it. We we feed a brain with with nutrition. We feed a brain with a sensory diet with with what we're we're exposing the brain to and how we're encouraging that plasticity and I I really appreciate everything you're saying, everything you're doing, Kyle. Thank you so much. Oh, this is amazing. Amazing. And we know that you're in demand. We know your patients are looking for you. So we, uh, we shan't keep you longer. All right. Well, guys, I I appreciate your time. Um, And yes, um, uh, thank you again for the opportunity. But I just, again, for those listeners out there, if you're searching for answers, um, I do, again, I'm a huge fan of having someone do a full neurological evaluation, pulling out food allergies, food sensitivities, get your gut checked, and um, go outside and exercise and watch some sunrises and sunsets. Yes, yes. Fabulous. And, and so simple. We can take control of that ourselves um, and uh, complement what you and your colleagues are doing neurologically. So there's so much we can do to help ourselves. Well, thank you yet again. We shall let your, your patients get your time now. And um, we look forward to to reading much more about SNA Biotech and your new book, uh, What If You Knew, A Revolutionary Approach to Regaining Your Health and Life. So thank you yet again, and we wish you a wonderful day, Dr. Dagel. Thank you, guys. All right, that's it for this episode of the Adventures in Brain Injury Podcast. Thanks for joining us. Uh, If you'd like to support us on Patreon, go to patreon.com forward slash AIBI. Throw us a bark or two, helps us out a lot. 
or uh, leave us a review on iTunes. That really helps us as well. Uh, it bumps it up. It bumps it up. It, it boosts <laughs> us up a little bit. <laughs> Get the word out. Feedabrain.com forward slash. Nah, I forgot now. iTunes. <laughs> AdventuresInBrandInjury.com forward slash iTunes will take you right there and you can leave a review. See, I love that you're so human, Kevin. We, we, <laughs> have, our, we have our little moments ourselves. <laughs> true story, true story. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what other housekeeping we got? Um, sponsorship opportunity, consultations. Uh, you, can, you can reach out to me for consultations. I am accepting new consultations. So, Along with your referrals from Revive Treatment Centers. Yes, yes, yes. And your book. You've got a lot of information, helpful information in a book for people who are uh, looking to help themselves before reaching out. Yeah, and anyway, you got a brain, you eat food, check it out. <laughs> How to feed a brain. <laughs> Feedabrain.com. Nice. And yeah, if you could leave us a review for the book. Do you have the book? Leave, us, leave me a review. You can go to feedabrain.com forward slash review. And it's set up to take you right to the spot on Amazon. You can just click on it and leave a review. Fabulous. That, that helps enormously. All yes. right. Yes, yes. Excellent work, my friend. You are out there conferencing, writing, speaking. It's tremendous. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, you, right now I'm in welcome. Chicago. Yes. So, uh, For now, you're in Chicago. <laughs> I feel, yeah, I did autism one and the uh, the neuro what is it neuro rehabilitation visual processing conference with Dr. Deborah Zelensky. Oh, she's she, terrific. Her work is fantastic. Tremendous. Yes, but, yes. Oh, you have no idea. I can't <laughs> wait to do some of this stuff with you. But let's let's get rolling. Okay. All right. Thank you guys so much. See you later. Bye.